Well, next time you go to the food store, look around. Are you picking up genetically modified foods? Because it seems to be everywhere. Let's talk about GMO foods. Jeffrey Smith, executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology, leading spokesperson on the health dangers of genetically modified foods. He's a world leader in GMO education, publisher of the Non-GMO Shopping Guide, founder of the Campaign for Healthier Eating in America. Welcome back to Coast to Coast, Jeffrey Smith. How did you get interested in genetically modified foods? It's not something you wake up in the morning and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to tell the world about this. What, what happened in your life? Well, in 1996, a molecular biologist gave a lecture about the health dangers and environmental dangers of GMOs to a small crowd in my town in Iowa. And he was an expert in genetic engineering, was an award-winning scientist, and knew absolutely that the technology was not ready for prime time. He was intimately aware of the fact that there was all sorts of unpredicted side effects and was aware that these side effects were not going to be evaluated before the foods were put on the market, could affect everyone who eats, and the, and the ecology could affect all living organisms, and because you can't recall them once they're released, could influence all future generations. So when I saw this unprecedented exposure of this amazing threat to our health and environment, I realized I needed to help translate his scientific concerns into language that everyone could understand. Uh-huh. I've been doing that ever since. Jeffrey, take us through what science has done with the first genetically modified seed, for example. How did they do this? What did they do? Let, let, and let's say it was a, a, a tomato, for lack of a better crop. In fact, the first genetically modified food released in the United States was a tomato. Ah, okay. So you've got these tiny little tomato seeds. What did they do to them? Well, typically, they used a gene gun. There's two major ways. Either use a gene gun or a bacterial infection. But let's start with the gene gun. Uh, you take the gene that you want to insert from some species. So you can take it from bacteria or viruses or humans or animals, whatever. And you make some changes in the genetic code so it works in the plant. You typically add a, an on switch called a promoter, which comes mostly from a virus. So you're sort of cobbling together pieces of DNA from a variety of kingdoms. Then you multiply the number of genes by the millions and then load your gun with them. You shoot that gun into a plate of millions of plant cells, hoping that some of those genes make it into the DNA of some of those cells. And stick, basically. Yes. They sort of end up near the DNA, and then a wound response heals it and integrates it into the DNA. And then you clone those cells into a plant, and now every single cell of that plant contains that new gene construct. Now, the process of insertion plus cloning, irrespective of what gene you put in, is causes unpredicted side effects, thousands, even hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. Up to 5% of the naturally functioning genes can change their levels of expression. You can have new allergens, higher levels of existing allergens, mm-hmm. new toxins, etc., as part of the process. And they, they would then grow these tomato seeds into plants, and hence that tomato and every seed in it would be a genetically modified seed, I guess, right? Exactly. In fact, when they genetically modify say, BT corn, which is corn that produces an insecticide, the insecticide is produced in every single cell of the plant. What would happen if they genetically modified humans at the rate that they've genetically modified plants? Well, right now you have 94% of the soybeans, 88% of the corn, 94% of the cotton, 95% of the sugar beets. It's, it's overwhelming it's in a short period of time how many of these crops are genetically engineered. And, you know, we would be seeing such dramatic side effects in health, mood, behavior, abilities, we would realize and gain respect for the fact that we don't really know what's going on. And, and i got to tell you, Jeffrey, people are acting weird. People are getting sick. People are having respiratory problems. They're having stomach ache prog- problems. How do we know it's not directly attributed to this? That's one of the things that I explore in the movie Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives. Um, we track a certain category of things that are going wrong, or several categories, in the lab animals. So when the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, for example, reviewed the peer-reviewed published studies, they said, this is messing up the animal's immune system, their reproductive system, their gastrointestinal system. It's causing organ damage. They're, they're aging faster, and insulin and cholesterol regulation has gone haywire. So this was the, these were the categories that they said are clearly affected in the lab animals. Now, we, as we'll, we'll talk about it as, as we go through this evening, we see the similar categories improving in pets and livestock when they get off of GMOs, improving in humans when they get off GMOs, and these same categories of diseases and disorders are on the rise in the U.S. population since GMOs were introduced. Interesting. In Very interesting. And as you know, there are no coincidences, I are agree. there? What was the original intent to create GMO foods? Well, the big, uh, the big player is Monsanto, 
they own uh, the patents to about 90% of the crops out there and by acreage. And their main thing was to sell more weed killer. So their weed killer roundup was going off patent in year 2000, and they wanted to have a kind of a de facto extension of their patent. So they created Roundup-ready crops, where if you buy the seeds, which are engineered not to die when sprayed with Roundup, then you had to buy Monsanto's version of the Roundup. And so they maintained dominance in this uh, most popular herbicide in the world. So that's the primary reason. So it wasn't to increase the, uh, the bushels of corn or soybeans. Originally, it was this Roundup. In fact, no GM, I mean, GM crops don't on average increase yield. The soybeans drop the yield by 5 to 11 percent. Uh, canola's down maybe 7.5 percent. Cotton's all over the place. There's a tiny increase with the GM corn that kills the corn borer because it, the corn borer can lower yield. But they haven't been able to satisfy many of the myths and promises about higher yield, soil tolerance, real drought tolerance. These are all things that go way beyond their primitive understanding of the DNA and ability to manipulate. Jeffrey, what was wrong with the, you know, God-given crops, and then you just use your insecticide? Oh, George, that's what I want to know. In fact, there's a God-given crop that's um, naturally resistant to the European corn borer, but I guess the problem was it wasn't genetically engineered and patentable, so they did not develop that, which could have outperformed the GMO. They, choose, they chose this new sexy technology, which gave them patents and ownership and control and the ability to, to charge more. And, on, and ongoing sales. Exactly. I mean, you can't, you can't, you're not allowed to save seed. You sign a contract that you won't save a seed that you buy that's genetically engineered, so they end up having a much higher profit from, rather than the, the farmers that save seeds year after year. You know, manufacturing has what they call obsolescence. It is the theory of make products that will last but not last forever. Because we want the, you know, the consumer to buy again, whether it's a washing machine or a dryer or a dishwasher or a lawnmower, whatever it is. The kind of things that they made years ago, Jeffrey, they lasted a long time. Heck, I remember my mother had one of the original Maytags, where if you had a tie and it got caught on the inside, it would suck you in, you know, on, in the rollers, one of those things. I mean, this thing lasted for almost forever. That doesn't happen anymore. A friend of mine went out and bought a brand new washing machine three years ago. And already she's got repairmen coming to fix it and replace parts and things like that. I would assume that the theory was, all right, let's make a, let's make a washing machine that breaks down after five years, and they got to buy another new one. But they'll be happy with it. It's disposable. Is that the same theory with this GMO, with the GMO seeds, in that you got to buy them every year? That's one way in which they're disposable. The other way is that they implode in their effectiveness. There's the Roundup-ready crops, but now the weeds have outsmarted Monsanto when you have Roundup-ready weeds, and so they have to bring in, now they want to bring in Agent Orange crops. Oh, my God. So, so it, it's like the bugs are now resistant to the, the uh, BT toxin, which is supposed to kill the corn rootworm, and it's causing all sorts of economic problems. So nature is revolting against GMOs, and so that's another way that they want to just bring another magic bullet in. Let's bring a new GMO in and uh, keep you know, cycling the farmers onto this treadmill of poisons. The proponents of GMO seeds and crops would say, look, you know what, I've eaten them, I feel okay, I'm fine, everything's good. How do we address that? I gave a talk today to a couple of hundred, maybe 300 people in the audience in Santa Rosa, and maybe half of them had already switched to non-GMO food. So I asked them, how many of you, when you switched to non-GMOs, felt better, saw some symptoms go away or improve? And 40 people raised their hands. Then we went through and asked what specific symptoms went away or improved. And it was uh, mental things like fatigue and foggyness. Mm -hmm. It was allergies. There was weight problems from another group. There was um, basically across the board. I've heard uh, infertility, restless leg syndrome, tons of gastrointestinal problems. And what's interesting is that I interviewed, and this is in the film Genetic Roulette, when I went to interview the doctors who had been prescribing non-GMO diets to patients for years, they were completely unambiguous. They said, GMOs cause inflammation. GMOs increase allergic responses among my aller uh, allergenic patients. GMOs do cause all these things. In fact, one, one um, uh, doctor from Chicago said that 100% of her patients get better on non-GMO diets. And so I went to Chicago and interviewed their patients, and it turns out irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, uh, morning fog, um, weight problems, skin problems, migraine headaches, all found relief when the person switched to non-GMO eating. That is remarkable. I mean, it, it is huge. You are in California. Yes. You're talking about an urgent project that California is working on. Tell us about Proposition 37. Well, Prop 37, which will be on the ballot on November 6th on Election Day, uh, would require, if it passes... And this is statewide. This is statewide in California, but it's certainly going to affect 
every single national brand, they would be required to label their foods genetically engineered if they use genetically modified ingredients. Now, this labeling that's required or would be required with Prop 37 is enjoyed already by the people of 49 countries, and it's desired by 91% of Americans. Now, this is historic. Nineteen states have tried through their state legislatures in the past 12 months to require labeling of GMOs. It didn't work. Did so it? Monsanto was threatening lawsuits in Vermont and Connecticut, so the governor officially caved to Monsanto. Well, lawsuits on what basis? Well, you know, they're going to claim that it's lack of freedom of speech, that it's interstate commerce problems. And the thing is, we know that they're going to lose the lawsuit, but as the governor of Vermont said, I'm in favor of labeling, but I don't want to burden the people of Vermont with an expensive lawsuit. Uh, by Monsanto. I've got to tell you, as a newsman, Jeffrey, a filed lawsuit like that by a company would be the greatest talk show story because it would tell you exactly that they want to hide things. I know. But the thing is this. The, the fortunes of Monsanto are intimately tied in hiding things because 53% of Americans say they would avoid GMOs if labeled. If they knew about it, yeah. So, so the food companies are already saying that if the labeling law co- comes to pass, they're going to remove GM ingredients, and that's going to affect Monsanto's bottom line. So they don't have much to lose by that lawsuit uh, infamy if, if it's compared to Good losing point. basically GMOs in the United States. And a lot of revenue. Yeah. My hope is that when it passes, that the food companies will all remove GMOs so no one has to label. Okay, but if they remove GMOs, and as you've told me, there's a huge percentage now of GMO foods and crops out there, where are they going to get the food in order to still sell? Excellent question. Most of the GMO crops are used for animal feed. And this particular labeling bill does not require labeling of milk and meat of animals that have been fed GMO. Ah. So we do have sufficient resources in non-GMO seed available in time to plant for the direct food ingredients. Okay, but they they will still pelt the animals with the GMO foods, and and the Passover to us could still be the same, right? In terms of whatever you're feeling because you're eating GMO foods, you still may get it if you are drinking milk or eating meat from an animal that ate it. Well, the Center for Veterinary Medicine of the FDA did warn their superiors repeatedly that the milk and meat of animals fed GMOs carry unique risks. You know that, of course, toxins can bioaccumulate in an animal, so you can actually have higher concentrations of toxins in, say, example, the fat of an animal than you have in the food that they're eating. But there's only been one study ever done on the effect of an animal that eats another animal that's eaten GMOs, and that's not yet published. Well, could you get, though, something out of Proposition 37 that would say... The, this sirloin that you're about to buy, and it's it's on the label, was from a a cow, a, you know, a, a herd of beef that ate genetically modified foods. It wouldn't be on Prop 37. That's already written, and there's good reason why. Because legally, you're only allowed to have one issue on a ballot initiative. And if it was sued once it passes, they could argue that animals that eat GMOs are not the same thing as genetically modified animals. Now you have two issues in Prop 37, which nullifies the whole thing. So it had to be basically about the main source of GMOs, which is basically the food in grocery stores. Perhaps a future initiative can focus on the milk and meat of animals that have been fed GMOs. But I think this is an excellent first step. Yeah, you've got to take a step first. Yeah, and when the food company set up a system to deliver the non-GMO uh, soy and corn derivatives, they're going to end up with extra non-GMO animal feed because that's often part of the same process, and then that'll increase the market availability of non-GMO feed. So some companies, like they do in Europe, are going to start bragging and boasting about using non-GMO feed, which will give a marketing advantage, Good point. et cetera. And, and it'll be labeled probably at a supermarket. Let's say you go to buy that steak. Would it possibly say organic or something like that? Absolutely. In fact, organic means that it's inten- not intentionally using any GMOs, or it could be grass-fed, for example, which until alfalfa came also meant no GMOs, but now that there's alfalfa, you need to have no genetically modified alfalfa as well. well how many states will look at this Proposition 37 if it passes, and do we have any polls on how it might do? Well, right now, I think uh, we're polling almost three to one in the state. But Huge. This is, this is before the big drop of the disinformation. Uh, Monsanto and others have gathered $27 million, and they're planning, they've are bought up a ton of advertising time on television, and they haven't yet let it last, but they're about to say, they're about to confuse voters by saying that labeling GMOs is confusing. They're going to spend more money than they'll ever spend on labeling by trying to convince Californians that labeling is too expensive. They've got self-contradictory arguments, but they're testing them in polls, they're testing them in focus groups to create some kind of emotional rejection response because their life is at stake, so to speak, the biotech industry, because they want to maintain their dominance through secrecy. Let, let me ask you something. That is it conceivable that if GMOs continue on its path, that all the God-given seeds of natural things 
will be gone. That's actually Monsanto's stated goal. Arthur Anderson, the consulting company that revealed how they worked with Monsanto in the end of, uh, of January 1999 at a conference, said that they asked the executive to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years, and they described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. And, the, and Anderson Consulting worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. Now, your, your question was brilliantly put there because people don't realize that what happens is our whole nature right now, all the seeds, etc., are the result of billions of years of evolution to this point. And that's the way it goes. But if we replace it in this generation, it's lost for all future generations. And in fact, at the same conference, a biotech company projected a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds within five years. Now, Jeez. it didn't happen because of the whistleblower. Was the gag order was lifted in Europe, and Europe we, we learned about the, the dangers of GMOs, and there was a tipping point of consumer rejection, so it was forced out of Europe, which stopped Africa from accepting it, and the U.S. started to get a little nervous. So fortunately, they haven't kept with their timetable. But most every single fruit, vegetable, grain, nut, etc., has been developed genetically engineered and is some level of the pipeline. So whether it's in a laboratory or in a field trial or in a sketch pad somewhere, they really are planning to patent and replace our, our natural seeds. And now we have genetically modified mosquitoes that have been released in three countries. They want to introduce genetically modified fish and animals. So it's not just fruits, vegetables, etc. It's livestock and insects. I heard a story, an early story of Monsanto, which I'm just going to pass it on because I heard it directly from the person in person. He claims it was repeated in Nova. I haven't done the fact-checking, but it sounds like it a, I want to put this out to your listeners because it's so interesting. Um, he was called to the principal's office in high school around 1976, and there were some men in suits, and they wanted to know what he had read when he hacked into a computer site. He had no idea until then that he had accidentally hacked into the CIA uh, right. a CIA site. They asked him over and over again what he saw, and he told him he, he read that there had been a plan with Monsanto and the CIA to drop termination seeds into developing countries to force famine, which would allow the U.S. to come and provide food in exchange for extracting resources and commitments. And he said wow. he had to sign all these non-disclosures, but then three years ago, Nova reported on it, so now it's out. So this is a way, that, theoretically, to use genetic engineering for uh, diabolical purposes. And we, have, we, we know that uh, the tobacco companies used it diabolically to create uh, more addictive nicotine, high levels of nicotine produced in genetically modified tobacco plants, smuggled into uh, Brazil, where it was called Tobacco Loco, because it made local farm workers dizzy and nauseous just by walking to the plants. Then they put them into U.S. cigarette packs illegally and distributed them to make people more addicted. What happens if something goes drastically wrong? Well, it almost did in a number of ways, and I'm going to give you three examples. Right. Two are historic, one is right now. Um, there was a bacteria that was genetically engineered to convert cellulose and plant material into alcohol, and then it had a residue that they were going to sell all over the country as fertilizer. And they were about to do it, and the graduate student, Elaine Ingham, insisted that they test the fertilizer on regular soil, and only at that point did they realize that the bacteria was still alive and was turning the roots into alcohol. So it was going <laughs> to render all this vast acreage all over the U.S. as completely infertile, and she stopped it, right? And she also found out from a person at the EPA, that the EPA had done an experiment and released a genetically modified bacteria variety and then set up monitoring stations miles all around and found that the bacteria had spread. It was kind of a test for spreading bacteria. Now they find the same genetically modified bacteria around the planet. It's, not, it's, it's found everywhere. So this bodes poorly for the next example of a near-miss situation, a genetically engineered bacteria so that it, it caused less frost on strawberries. You see, there was a bacterium called Pseudomonas syringii. So it's called syringii because it was shaped like a syringe, and the point condensed water. And so when this bacteria was around uh, strawberries, it would coalesce the water. The water would then have frost. It would damage the strawberries. They sprayed it on strawberries, but then the court uh, ordered them to incinerate because they hadn't taken it, uh, into account the fact that it could also uh, cut the frost and kill certain weeds. But later, this is very interesting, that they, I, I learned that the Pseudomonas syringii is airborne above California and is responsible for maybe 50% of the condensation of the rain that blows in, of the, of the wet air that blows in off the Pacific. So what happened was the genetically engineered version of this bacteria did not have the pointy syringe. It was blunt, so it did not condense rain into, into drops. So if they had released it and if it had spread around the world, it could have permanently changed the weather patterns. Oh, my gosh. So these are two things that were historic that were near misses. But today I was getting... I heard a talk from Don Huber. We've talked about him before. I'm, I'm with him today in Santa Rosa. And he describes this new ultra-small organism that, it, that was discovered in 2002 
that if you uh, expose it to a pregnant chicken, it kills the embryo in 24 to 48 hours. It's found in high concentrations in the feed of animals that are having infertility and miscarriages. It's found in the aborted fetal tissue in the semen samples. And he says it's affecting humans as well. He says that the, the infertility rate and the, or the, or the uh, miscarriage rate is as high as 45%. In the U.S., there is an absolute epidemic of infertility and miscarriages among livestock and also growing in humans. And so we may be facing a huge epidemic of infertility because of this organism, which seems to be promoted by Roundup, which is used on genetically modified Roundup ready crops. Is this the andrometer strain all over again? Uh, you know, I, I can only say this, that um, this man, Don Huber, spent over 40 years in military and professional capacities evaluating man-made and natural threats, including biological warfare, again, for military intelligence. And he wrote a letter to Secretary Vilsack and said this is of a high-risk nature and it's unique. In layman's terms, it should be treated as an emergency. And he urged Secretary Vilsack not to approve Roundup Ready Alfalfa, which, if Roundup was confirmed as a promoter of this organism, it would be pouring fuel on the fire. But instead of acknowledging the problem and sending in resources to evaluate, they completely ignored the Huber letter, and they, they approved Roundup Ready Alfalfa, and they never followed up to support the research to see if this, in fact, was causing infertility and miscarriages in humans and animals. So let's go to the, the, uh, the big news, one of the big pieces that are revealed in the film. Uh, and by the way, people can see a trailer at geneticroulettemovie.com, geneticroulettemovie. Um, I kept this piece of information hidden uh, for a couple of years because I was trying to inspire research into it to see if I can uh, get more information on it, but I had to release it in the film. It's time to do that. Um, in South Africa, they eat corn as a staple three times a day, sometimes 70% of their caloric intake. Now, there was a story of a farmer in South Africa who was having serious health problems with his dairy cows and pigs, uh, arthritic conditions, infertility, Alzheimer-type things, cannibalism. All of them. Really terrible stuff. And a veterinarian who's, who's interviewed on the film says he told the guy from South Africa to switch to non-GMO corn. He did all the problems he was experiencing disappeared, but then so did the non-GMO corn because he didn't make enough to carry through the whole year. So he had to switch to the corn that was available in the market. He brought that in. All the health problems returned. He finally was able to grow enough corn for year-round supply. The health problems disappeared. But here's the kicker. His farm workers were eating the corn grown on the farm. And so they were eating 100% genetically modified corn three times a day okay. as much as 70% of their caloric intake. Same symptoms. I yes, they were having severe headaches flu-like symptoms, inflammation, and what happened was that about once or twice a month, they would come up, the, the farmer would notice a certain symptom where the eyes wouldn't track. One would go one way and one would go the other way. He said within 24 to 48 hours later, the person would be dead. Once or twice a month. He said he had to keep 20% extra workers on the farm because so many were sick all the time. He was spending a fortune in the medicines. He had no idea why, but when he switched to non-GMO corn, for his animals, the workers got better. So, you, so it changes almost as fast as the symptoms come up. That's what's interesting. When I went to the, uh, the offices in Chicago of Emily Lindner, who's an uh, internist, she had told me at the American Academy of Environmental Medicine conference in 2009 that all of her patients get better when they switch to non gmo diets. And that was about 5,000 of them since she had started to prescribe it. So I said, let me come and speak to your patients. And I spoke to someone who was on a non gmo diet for just 25 days. By the third day, she had a 30-year bowel with Crohn's disease that was gone. Another person with irritable bowel, a week and a half. A person with another irritable bowel person, four weeks. Uh, migraine headaches, skin problems, weight problems, all very quickly. In fact, Dr. Lindner even said, if it's like fogginess or depression or whatnot, it's eliminated immediately. If it's asthma or allergies, it's three to five days. If it's certain gastrointestinal problems, it'll take like up to two, three, four weeks. Sometimes people get better over two years. But she had it down to a science. And so when I was interviewing them, I interviewed her patients, I interviewed other patients. We started getting unsolicited comments from people all over the world about when they, when they ate in Europe, they're healthy. When they eat in the United States, they're not. When they switch to organic, they're healthy, etc. People with restless leg syndrome, etc. But when people switch to non-GMO foods, they often have to buy organic or switch to less processed foods. And there's all sorts of cofactors that might be contributing to their improved symptoms, like the organic products, like less additives. But when we started the same month as I interviewed with Emily Linder and her patients, we started interviewing the veterinarians and the farmers, and they're, they're quoted. They're, you can see them in the movie Genetic Roulette. 
they, they found that immediately when the animals switched from GM corn to non-GM corn, and there's no cofactors, they weren't switching to organic, they weren't eliminating processed foods, there was a dramatic increase. Within two or three days, there was a, a pig farmer in Germany, or in Denmark, where within two days, massive, sometimes fatal diarrhea he was struggling with for years, disappeared. When in, in Western Iowa, within two or three days, the behavior and health improved dramatically of the 750 piglets in, the, in each nursery of four nurseries. So this was dramatic. And likewise, in the film, we talked to someone who was client, had a hobby farm for, for miniature steers, and when he switched to GM corn, 90% of the steers died within two weeks. Within two weeks? Within two weeks. Okay, as so we look at all of this, with all the GMOs we continue to eat, the exposure, are there any studies, concrete studies out there, Jeffrey, about this? Or is it just, hey, you know what, if they eat the corn, they've been getting sick? Well, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine looked at the animal feeding studies as of 2009 and determined that it was not a casual relationship between GMOs and disorders. It was a causal one. And they looked at very specifically what was happening to the animals. Now, uh, when people reanalyzed Monsanto's own raw data for the rats that supposedly passed with flying colors after eating their genetically modified corn for 90 days, the real statistics show that there were signs of toxicity. Uh, with humans, uh, it's even a little more scary. Um, there was 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada had BT toxin, which is a pesticide produced by Monsanto's genetically modified corn. It was circulating in their blood, and it was in the blood of 80% of their unborn fetuses. And in this year, in, in February, in the Journal of Applied Toxicology, they found that that same BT toxin, which is in our blood, can break holes in the cell walls of human cells, causing leakage. That's how it kills insects. They didn't think it had any impact on human cells. Now they know it does. So we have a toxin that breaks holes in human cells in our diets, in our bloodstream, in our unborn fetuses, possibly in their brains, because it's across the undeveloped blood-brain barrier. And we have, and we know, here's another example, autism. Okay, we have in the film three different parents of autistic kids saying when they switch to non-GM foods, the autism symptoms subside. Subside. Go, go, go away totally or just subside? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. One person told me uh, that her kids were like, her son was 80% organic and 80% recovered. And she was telling people 80% organic, 80% recovered. And then she realized, oh, my God, I'm saying the same word twice. Yeah. I've got to go 100%. So she went 100%. Huh. And she said, now the kid is like 95% recovered or close to 100%. And it took just a few months after switching to fully organic non-GMO. Another guy said when he switched to non-GMO, the, the, the whole gastrointestinal disorders and the, he describes the horrible bowel movements and this thing and that thing. And now, now his son has like, he calls it a, like a neurotypical kid. Jeffrey, in your opinion, how much of this stuff do we need to ingest before we start feeling sick? It really depends on which genetically modified crop and how sensitive we are. There was a panel of some of the top allergists in the country who were asked to evaluate the threat of a genetically modified corn variety that they said had a probable chance, of a mid-probable chance of being an allergen. And they said, first of all, there's no minimum level because very, very tiny amounts can cause allergic reactions. And there was a genetically engineered food supplement called L-tryptophan produced by one company in, in the 1980s. In Japan. In Japan, right. And it, the Showa Denko, the company that produced it, um, they submitted it for the U.S. Uh, pharmaceutical standard, and it passed. It was 98.5% pure, and it had five or six contaminants, which mm -hmm. the largest contamination was 0.1%. And so it was tiny amounts of contamination, and yet these contaminants turned out to be deadly. They killed about 100 Americans, caused five to 10,000 to fall sick or become permanently yeah, disabled. And the thing is, um, it was on the market for about four years, and it was almost missed, and it was causing this epidemic. The only reason it was discovered was because the symptoms had three simultaneous characteristics that were screening to be identified. It was a new disease, it was an acute disease, and it was fast-acting. Now, if the GMO crops on the market are causing something that don't have all three characteristics, if it's producing an increase of an existing disease, no one's going to look at GMOs. If it's not acute, no one's going to look. If it's not immediate and it takes, say, the second generation to show up, we will completely miss it, and no one is monitoring the problem. And how soon do you get better once you stop? That's very interesting. Uh, some doctors say it depends on the, on the problem. I think the one person said um, it can take uh, from a few days up to a couple of months, and then sometimes people continue to get better over two years. They took uh, mice in an Italian study and fed them genetically modified soy for eight months, and they had damage to their testicles, to their pancreas, and to their liver. And then they took some of the mice and switched them to a non-GM soy diet, and a lot of the problems started to go away within that month. So we're seeing pretty quick responses in laboratory animals, some enormously quick responses in livestock. So um, there was a, in my film we talk about a livestock feedlot owner who said he didn't realize it, but 
uh, the more he fed genetically modified corn, the more deaths he'd have on his feedlot. Now, with that, they didn't die for 60 to 80 days. It was after that that they started getting things like pneumonia and stuff. Good, good point. I, I guess if you're buying grain, let's say, or something for your horses, if you have a little farm or something, you better check into that stuff. Totally. And horses also eat sugar beet pulp. And they have very sensitive guts. Yes. In fact, I was, there, was a, there was a rash of, of serious health problems in racehorses right after sugar beets were genetically engineered. And I was called, and we tried to get an investigation going, but no one took the bait, so to speak. But uh, it was interesting. One of the women that was involved in this, she was suspecting there was a change in the gut bacteria of the horses. And that's a very, very serious problem. You see, Roundup is in very high concentrations in Roundup ready crops. It kills the good and bad bacteria. Exactly. Now, with botulism, there's a good bacteria keeps the botulism bacteria in check. But at very tiny concentrations of Roundup, the, the beneficial controlling bacteria is killed. And so it can cause a huge uprise in botulism poisoning inside the stomach of the cows, which is in very high proportions now in Europe and growing in the United States. And there's now evidence that botulism is linked to sudden infant death syndrome hmm. and that the, uh, pre the prevalence of Roundup now in the feed of animals may be promoting SIDS. We've been getting lots of stories and reports of uh, contaminated uh, treats from China for our pets. What about these kinds of foods? I mean... I, I would say most pet foods are made from GMO-type foods now. I interview in the film Genetic Roulette Dr. Michael Fox, who's called Animal Doctor. He has a syndicated column to 25 to 30 million readers. And he said that when GMOs were introduced into the human food supply, the, the cats and dogs who eat the byproducts of the human industrial system were being exposed for the first time. And he got letters from all over the country about gastrointestinal disorders like diarrhea and inflammatory bowel disease, as well as itching and other allergic reactions. So he told his readers, take out the genetically modified corn and soy, and he's got 40 to 60 letters in a file drawer of satisfied pet owners, but others were just following the advice of their other veterinarians who were not aware of the problem, and they were putting on specialized diets, but because those specialized diets still contained the corn or soy that was genetically engineered, the animals weren't getting better. At all? Right. So what do we do? What is, a, what, what is somebody who would go to one of these big pet stores, for example, and pick up the, the you know, well-named brand pet foods that they expect to be good, what do they do? Well, I haven't studied all the brands in the pet world, uh, but there are organic uh, brands of pet food, and there's uh, ways to make pet food, and there's probably pet food out there that doesn't contain soy or corn. So if people have to do their own research. Now, with human food, we make it easier. We have non-gmoshoppingguide.com, and we have an iPhone application called Shop No GMO. Both are free. So Shop No GMO, you can download from iTunes. Non-GMO Shopping Guide, you can just go to the, the site. And there we have thousands of products that have been third-party verified as non-GMO listed in the category that you'd shop, so baked goods, snacks, beverages, etc. It makes it much easier. Now, if you come to a product that's not in the shopping guide and you want to know if it's genetically engineered or not, if it says organic, then you know it's not intentionally genetically engineered. And if it says non-GMO on the package, then you know efforts were made to prevent contamination from GMOs. If it doesn't have organic or non-GMO on the label, then you have to read the ingredients and avoid the nine genetically modified food crops, which are soy, corn, cotton, which is used for cotton. And you've got this on your website. Yes, yeah. yeah. it's it, it, it in the shopping guide. So I'll just say it so everyone hears just it. Just to more. remember. Yeah. Right. Soy, corn, cottonseed oil, canola oil, sugar from sugar beets, alfalfa, which is used as hay, papaya from China or, or Hawaii, a little zucchini and a little crooked squash. Those are the Gosh. only ones. What about rice? Is it there yet? No, they've created genetically modified rice. It's contaminated the, the regular rice in very small quantities, but it hasn't yet been commercialized. There's a huge concern because it's a staple in Asia. People eat a lot of it. If it's genetically engineered and it causes problems, it could cause huge problems. Can we win? I think that even though GMOs are one of the hardest problem, one of the worst problems facing mankind and the environment, I think it's one of the easiest of those hard problem categories. And the reason is this, George, because... With food, people can vote with their dollars, and it doesn't have to be a theoretical thing about not liking one cent or the way they treat farmers. It's knowing that if you eat a genetically modified corn chip, the gene that produces the BT toxin might transfer into your intestinal flora and turn it into living pesticide factories. When people realize the health dangers of GMOs that have documented and the theoretical risks as well, they don't want to expose their bodies or especially their children who are most at risk. So we think as little as 5% of U.S. shoppers avoiding GM ingredients 
would be sufficient to create a tipping point of consumer rejection, forcing them out of the market. And it was a tipping point of consumer rejection that kicked GMOs out of Europe in 1999. It was a tipping point of consumer rejection because of the cancer risks of milk from cows treated with bovine growth hormone, Monsanto's genetically engineered drug, that, that kicked that out of Walmart, Starbucks, you'll play down in most American dairies. So yes, George, I think not only can we win, but we're already seeing an early sign of the tipping point, many of them. And I think this whole demand for labeling is a result of the increased awareness in the collective consciousness of the U.S. population expressing the demand to avoid GMOs. Uh, popcorn is not genetically engineered, thank heavens. Uh, but is not? It's not. No popcorn on the shelves? No popcorn. It doesn't even cross-pollinate. Why not? Um, it just hasn't been a big enough commercialized product, so it hasn't been introduced by the companies. It's not like there's a magic reason. It's just that it wasn't commercially important enough to develop. All right, so popcorn's good. So far, it's okay. Just don't cook it in the oils from soy corn, cotton, cedar, and <laughs> <laughs> and then we're trapped. Right. That's why you use olive oil. Have they gotten our olives yet? No, but if you buy olive oil, it might be secretly and illegally spiked with canola oil because the olive oil production, the olive oil consumption, uh-huh. is beyond the olive oil production. Is... I tell you this, when I go to, to restaurants and I avoid uh, vegetable oils, which is soybean oil, and I avoid canola, cottonseed, and corn, if they say they use olive oil, I always say, is that pure olive oil or a blend? Well, that's my question. The cheaper brand that I see at the store that comes out with their own brand name, for example. Right. What are the odds, then, of that being that kind of combination? I don't know the percentages there. I just know that um, it's well known in the foodie circles that, as I say, the consumption of olive oil exceeds the production, and there's a lot of canola oil imported into Italy, for example, that ends up going out in the form of blended olive oil. Unfortunately, the lines of communication to the average GMO farmer or Midwest farmer is almost entirely controlled by the biotech industry. So the biotech industry is the seed dealer, is the chemical dealer. They control the, the research at the land-grant universities and how the agricultural extension agents represent it. They control the editorial section of the, of the farm magazines and radios where they advertise. They have, and they control even the research agenda of so many academic institutions that the farmers are, are often completely blindsided. And this is not just in the United States. You have countries like India, where independent research shows that farmers are losing income when they switch to Monsanto's cotton varieties, and yet they continue to switch because of the incredible disinformation campaign that's mounted promising great profit and and freedom by switching to these more expensive genetically engineered crops. And unfortunately, the cotton turns out to be very unreliable, and many of the farmers are borrowing from loan sharks, secondary markets, and about 200,000 farmers have committed suicide after planting Monsanto's BT cotton seeds and have been unable to pay back their loans, and so they are facing loss of their land. And they killed themselves? Yes. Let's get back to this infertility again that Professor Don Huber was right. discussing in this path of it. At what point does it pass on to human beings, if it hasn't already? You know, in his letter to Secretary Vilsack, he said it could cause problems to humans. In his, in his private conversations, I've heard his concern, and today, when he was talking... In Santa Rosa, I heard him twice today, he said that there's a possibility for humans, but he tends not to want to emphasize that because it's such explosive information. Fertility is such a sensitive topic. But what we are seeing, and this was remarkable, that the number of miscarriages that is happening in certain communities is so huge. Astronomically Uh, higher than the norm in other areas, right? Yes. Yes. And are they, are they able to trace this to farm communities or what? They have traced the organism in humans, but they're not talking about it much, so I'm going to leave it there. Tell me a little bit about Michelle Perro again. Dr. Michelle Perro, she's one of the top pediatricians in America, uh, voted consistently in that, in that capacity, and she lives in California in the Bay Area. And I interviewed her, and what was interesting was this. She was doing a talk on GMOs and went to my book, Genetic Roulette, so both a book and a movie, and saw pictures of the intestinal walls and the stomach lining of rats that were fed genetically engineered potatoes. And she looked at it and she said to herself, "Uh uh-oh, we've got a problem. The reason is, in her practice, she sees this type of distortion and problems in the gut of children. She said that she sees kids that are allergic to every food group. She says she sees kids now that have failure to thrive. They can't gain weight. They cry constantly. Completely new categories of diseases and new severity of diseases And when she looked at the research on GMOs, her conclusion was, this is probably the main reason why she's seeing all these problems in kids now that she wasn't seeing before. Isn't that amazing? And she talks about the leaky gut, too. A lot of doctors are looking at the holes in the intestines where the junctures are kind of open, 
And we illustrate this in the movie that if undigested food particles get through the intestines into the bloodstream, they, not, they, don't, they, they don't appear as food to the immune system. They appear as foreign and attackers. And so it trains the immune system to respond to the pieces of food, which can then lead to food allergies and autoimmune disease and inflammation, and some doctors say cancer and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and all sorts of things, and autism linked to leaky gut. At this point, Jeffrey, what list is longer? The list that contains GMO foods or the list that does not? Well, if you're talking about processed packaged foods, generally in the center of a supermarket, I would say close to 90% have at least some processed genetically engineered ingredients. Oh. Now, it might be a tiny amount. It might be a little bit of dextrose or maltodextrin or soy lecithin, but unfortunately, it is pervasive. So I'm really hoping that Prop 37 passes, and people can go to our website at responsibletechnology.org and sign up for the newsletter. Get They can get a free chapter of Feeds of Deception, but they can also start learning about what they can do, whether they live in California or not, because we, they can call into California and tell people about it. They can make donations. They can tweet and Facebook and, and forward emails about GMOs, because right now what's, what's about to happen is this huge disinformation campaign is going to be unleashed, and if California is able to withstand that and pass Prop 37, then the entire country will benefit. Yeah, the I, I think so. It'll yeah. be a huge story.